Hello and welcome to another virtual author chat at the Poison Pen Bookstore. I'm John Charles and the Poison Pen is doubly blessed today to have with us two authors, Sheila and Gerhardt Roberts. Before we begin our chat, I'd like to let those listening in know that we do have copies of both Sheila's and Gerhardt's new book available for purchase. So if you find yourself intrigued after listening to the authors, feel free to go online to the Poison Pen Bookstore or give us a call and we would be happy to either hold copies for you or put them in the mail and send them out to you. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Gerhardt and Sheila. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. We appreciate it so much. Um, why don't we start with you, Sheila, with almost 50 books, I think that's correct to your credit. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, you know, I, it's interesting. Someone once said that what you're doing as a child is often a reflection of what you'll be doing as a grown up. And I was writing little stories when I was in grade school and torturing my third and fourth grade classes. They all had to listen to the latest Sheila creation, those poor kids, captive audience. But so I was always doing that. Music is my other thing. And even as a little kid, I was always was writing little songs. And so it's interesting. That's kind of what I wound up doing as an adult. I did a, a lot of things in music before I became a writer. And then of course, fell into writing, kind of fell backwards, banging my head on the wall, trying to make it as a songwriter. And people say it's really hard to succeed as a writer. Let me tell you, it's 10 times harder to succeed as a songwriter. But anyway, so I sort of fell into my writing career, but um, it's been a, a blessing and a delight. And I've, I've enjoyed being able to do what I love for a living. Not everybody can say that. So I'm happy to be able to say that I love doing what I'm doing for a living. What was your initial path to publication like? Well, again, it's just so bizarre. I just sort of fell into it. I, I got an idea one day for a book and I had a girlfriend who was a romance writer. And I remember saying, I should tell Sharon about this idea. It was for a lady, kind of a lady Robin Hood type uh, woman. And it was a Regency setting. And I thought, I'm going to tell her about this book idea. And then I remember thinking, wait a minute, I need money. Maybe I'll just write this book myself. And so I stumbled into this thing and um, found my first agent. There was a, a, a the writer's guide, writers. Remember that big, thick book that you yes. get when you were a writer and you list all the publishers? What's the name of that? Can't think of the name. Now I can see the book too, and I can't think of the title. Writer, writer's Market. I yeah, think. the Writer's Market. And um, we just kind of you know, went, well, this looks good. <laughs> and sent to an agent and lo and behold she liked the book idea and I, I got my first sale so I I just really fell into my writing career having said that lest anybody think this is an easy career um, I have this theory that you pay your dues in this business and you will either pay them at the beginning of their career the middle of your career or toward the end of your career but you will pay your dues and so I paid mine about part way through I did some fumbling and bumbling I've actually crashed my career twice and I'm risen from the ashes. I'm like Cher, I just keep reinventing myself. So the final invention seems to have worked okay and, and I'm on, on solid ground, but it's just, this is not a career for the faint of heart if you want to really do well at it. You have to work at it and you have to work at your craft. And um, as my darling here has been discovering, we have been sent him back to the drawing board for many drafts on his book. And even now he is doing some reformatting and realizing he needed to do some different things. And um, we've written a book together that I'm hoping our agent will be able to sell. It, it's a historical. So he's getting into writing as well. And like I said, learning that it is not an easy, oh gee, I just don't think I'll bang out a book kind of thing. Tell us a little bit about your new book, which is A Little <clears throat> Christmas Spirit. You know, John, this is like, I think really this is the best book I've ever written. It is my favorite book. I love this book. And it's kind of my homage to Dickens. I think one of the best stories ever, ever written was A Christmas Carol. It's just brilliant. The whole concept and being haunted by the ghosts and this guy's life and how he changes from this, this you know, hard hearted man to someone who really joins the human race again. And, and so I modeled, I, I wanted to have a little, my own little grumpy Scrooge character. And so I have my little, my widower, my, my bitter widower, who is just pretty much withdrawing from the world. And I think it's a little bit like a man named Ove does Christmas basically, because this guy is just, I've had it and I don't, I don't want to do anybody, I don't want to go anywhere. And things just keep getting forced on him. And he does get haunted, but he doesn't have the ghosts of Christmas, past, present, and future. He gets haunted by his wife, who is going to make sure he gets his act together and finds his Christmas spirit again. And so I just, I just love the story. I had so much fun writing it, and I'm 
greatly enamored of this book, said she modestly. It is a terrific book. And you mentioned Dickens and the Christmas Carol. Do you have a favorite cinematic version of that story? Yes, absolutely. The one with um, George C. Scott. That is a brilliant, brilliant. We watch that almost every Christmas. I, I just think it's it's just a fabulous rendition of the story. So yeah, that's my fave. Do you have a favorite? Uh, the Muppet Christmas Carol? Yeah. <laughs> what? The Muppet Christmas Carol. Oh, the Muppet. <laughs> You're so cute. I haven't actually seen the Muppet Christmas Carol. I may have to watch that. It's actually kind of true to the spirit of the story. You'll have to put that on your watch list. This year. Okay, I will, do, I will definitely put that on my watch list. Um, okay, let's switch gears a little bit. And Gerhardt, tell us a little bit about yourself. You have a background in Germany and that's reflected in your book. I do. I grew up in Germany as an American practically right after World War II. And so as a child, uh, playing with my German friends in the ruins of, a, of Bremerhaven, which is on the North Sea in Germany. And so I spent uh, almost all of grade school in Germany. And then we came back to the States and for a brief period. And for high school, we were back in Germany. And so Germany and of course my German heritage kind of got into my blood. And um, I eventually majored in college and in grad school in German language and literature. And so the books I write are kind of an extension of that. Are you going to tell me we're a spy? When I was, uh, right, after college, was. right after college, I was drafted into the military. That was Vietnam era. And so I ran down and enlisted. And I uh, ended up in Germany working for the army branch of the NSA. And we always deny that we spy on people, of course. But uh, I was in the East German branch and we tracked the, uh, the um, goings and comings of the East German army, the Russian army, East German diplomats, that type of thing. So if you had to be in the German army, it was a great, it was a great, uh, great tour. And she was with me during the last year we lived in a little village in Bavaria. So kind of an idyllic beginning to a wonderful life. <laughs> And it was really funny because he couldn't, of course, couldn't tell me anything he did. And he would talk in his sleep in German. And I mean, I didn't know enough. to be so frustrating to him. Like, what are you saying? You know, and one time, this was after we got out of Germany. Can I tell the tale about your karate chopping the windshield shade? Too uh, late. Why not? <laughs> I woke up one night and we, our first house was this funky old farmhouse. And they had, remember those window shades that you could like pull down and they had a little thing. On there, and if you went up too fast, it would go, boom, boom, boom. Yeah. I woke up to, boom, boom, boom. And here's my husband like crouching bit in this karate chop. And I'm like, what on earth? And I mean, he didn't even know he'd done it. So I'm going, I don't know what on earth happened to you over there. <laughs> I don't know really if I think, but anyway, so he, he has a very interesting background in Germany. And I know that's probably what's contributed to your interest in all things Germanic. Right. Now you were teaching apparently a class at a university on the Holocaust and that inspired Safe Harbor? Oh, yeah, that actually started the uh, my my thinking about writing this book i i, I taught a, ca a class on the holocaust at chapman university it's been a few years but i taught it several times and we of course got into studying the history of the jewish race um, the incarceration of the jews the attempted extermination of the jews all things about the holocaust uh, from the roots of it way back probably in the 1500s when the Jews first kind of wandered into German lands. And uh, so that kind of started me on this journey toward reading as much as I could about the subject. And uh, I one day stumbled upon some books that dealt with people who had been reclassified by, as Jews by the Nazis. There was a law that came out. And because there was a lot of confusion in Germany regarding who's a Jew and who isn't a Jew after Hitler took power. And the Nazis decided that if you had one Jewish grandparent, you were Jewish, you were un undesirable. And so many people then had to, uh, were reclassified as Jews, even though they thought they were Lutheran or Catholics. And um, uh, this book had to do with what they called U-boats, people who dove under the surface of everyday life to to hide out. Some of them looked like Germans, so they could hide in plain sight, but to hide out 
uh, from the Nazis until hopefully the war would end. Uh, many Jews, there were 160,000 Jews in Berlin alone before the war. And even after um, uh, Joseph Goebbels said in 1943, we have cleansed Berlin of, of, of Jews, there were still 7,000 of these U-boats in Berlin just hiding in the shadows. And that kind of started me on the journey to writing this book, Safe Harbor. It was a journey that took um, quite a few turns, wasn't it? It did, right. Um, I started the book in, gosh, I think 2015. And during writing it, I would bring my pages to Sheila, who, who would tear them completely apart. <laughs> and so um, it, it took me a long time to write it. I, <clears throat> writing is difficult for me anyway. And so the many turns involved, um, I think I went through like nine different revisions of it before Sheila was finally happy with it. And so, it, yeah, it was a long process. Well, I'm still working on it, making sure it's formatted properly. Yeah. And it's, it's a learning curve, you know, when you, he decided, I'm, you know, I'm just going to do this myself. I'm going to go, and go that route. And there's a huge learning curve when you're doing that. I think it's another bit of a misnomer that people think, well, I'm just going to write this book and you know, put it up on Amazon, put it here, put it there, you know, and um, there's just so much more to that. And I think it's, it, it's something you learn as you go that this just isn't quite as easy and fast as I thought it was going to be. Not if you want to have something that people are really going to really want to read. So now the title Safe Harbor is kind of what your two main characters are looking for. Can you kind of tell those listening in a little bit about the story? Well, they, uh, the, these, the two main characters, a young man, 18 or so, and uh, his girlfriend, fiance, 17 or 18, they discover that they have been, based on the Nuremberg Laws of 19, uh, uh, 1935 on race and marriage, they have discovered that they've been classified as Jewish. They're proud of their Jewish heritage, but all of a sudden they, decide, they discover that they are in jeopardy because the Jews after 1933, uh, any government employee that was a, was a Jew was eventually forced out. And so the original goal of Hitler was to impoverish them, to get them to leave. Many did, but many stayed. And these two people, because they still have family ties in Germany, decide to stay. Um, the young girl Nessa doesn't want to leave because she has relatives she, who are Jewish, who she doesn't want to leave. It, they're elderly. And so they decide to stay and go underground and help spirit Jews in jeopardy or anybody in jeopardy out of the country. And that was happening, wasn't it? I mean, weren't, there were people, of course, trying to get them out even though the borders were not closed for them right, to leave. Right, the, uh, <clears throat> There were some Jewish groups who were more proactive than others that they would not shy away from violence, which is fine in, in the face of the Nazis probably. And there were other groups who were more careful, so to speak, and, and they just quietly got the word out to the Jewish rabbis that there was a way out of Germany. And these groups spirited these people out of, out of the country. Usually they went down toward the Swiss border, which was not, in many places, it was not barricaded, it was just guarded. And, you know, they would bribe people, whatever, bribe the guards uh, and, you know, hundreds and hundreds of them got out of Germany. Their final destination was Lisbon, because that was a free country, free city, Portugal. And the hope was they could then get on a ship to the Americas. Yes, so these two people spend you know, years underground creating false identification. Um, escorting people uh, escorting, out of Dodge. Escorting people out of Germany, oh. yeah. Um, what kinds of resources did you use while you were researching the book? Did you look at archives, diaries, letters? Talk a little bit about the research for the book. Okay, well, the re research actually started with my teaching a course on the Holocaust. And so I probably read about 20 books on that subject 
everything from the establishment of the death camps. Uh, I also looked at books on, on Jewish history. I looked at uh, histories of the Holocaust. I looked at the, uh, some of the biographies of the various uh, commandants who were, who headed up the death camps and, and also concentration camps. We have to remember there was a big difference between the death camps uh, like Auschwitz, Treblinka, and, and then of course, the Sachsenhausen and others, uh, which were concentration camps. And so I looked into that and uh, the basic history of Germany, because it extends clear back to the 1500s when the Jews first wandered, as I said, into the German lands, because they were different. They were eventually ghettoized because they were different. If, if it was thought that they <clears throat> scooped up uh, Christian children and ate them, uh, if uh, during the plague, 1300s, 1400s, 1500s in those areas, it was theorized that the Jews had poisoned the wells. That's why people were dying. And so this vast expense of history I went through uh, to get an idea, because I'm not Jewish, uh, of what the Jews went through to finally end up uh, being annihilated practically. We have to remember in Germany, there were five only, there were only half a million uh, Jews in Germany. And that was only like one half of a percent or even less of the total people in Germany. And so they weren't really as big a problem. They couldn't be as big a problem as Hitler made them out to be. But they made a very convenient scapegoat. Right. You know, and you're, when there's problems or you're trying to restructure a country, you always look for a scapegoat, correct? Right. And they had, the Jews were banned basically from the occupate from the profession so you wouldn't have a a guild trained jewish butcher or, or shoemaker of course you know they were jewish in the ghettos they were jewish uh, butchers and shoe shoemakers and so they uh eventually because they were banned from most of this activity they became traveling merchants they became merchants who became very wealthy with very large department stores throughout germany and they became bankers. And so they had a lot of money. They were very successful and jealousy arose and the Germans, specifically the Nazis, wanted that money. And eventually their, their uh, tact was to impoverish them first and get their money, hoping they would leave. Some of them uh, unfortunately fled to the East and they were caught up with, uh, anyway, uh, others, uh, as I said, were so impoverished, they could not even leave Germany and had to go underground. So that's the kind of the vast body of uh, material that I, that I went through just in preparation to write the book. Let's um, switch back to you, Sheila, for a minute. One of the things that I love about your books is there's always a lot of rich themes beneath the entertaining storyline that you craft. I think for your recent book, if I had to pin it down, I would say you were maybe trying to write about how you want to look for the best in people, even when it's the most difficult to find that. Can you talk a little bit about that? I think that's that's a very good um, a good theme, and it does run through the book. It's I think sometimes we tend to make snap judgments about people. You know, I, you meet somebody and maybe they're just having a cranky day or one stupid thing a person does and you hold it against them forever. And we're all flawed, you know, and I think it's important to keep track of that as we're interacting with each other. I, I, I think about the Bible verse that says, you know, you don't, you don't just forgive people seven times, you forgive them 70 times seven. And um, this guy was obviously in need of someone to take him by the hand and, and lead him back into the world. And I think that was the other theme that the, the wife kept trying to drum into him. It is a short life and you do not want to waste it. And uh, it, it's just so important. Everyone has a purpose while they're here. I believe that. And as long as you're here, you're here for a reason. 
And when you're not fulfilling that purpose, when you're just withdrawing and not being part of the human race, you are depriving not only others of what you could bring to them, you're depriving yourself as well. And so I, I think by the end of the story, my little Stanley man learned that and got back into the human race and, and realized that he still had a life to live. And it's very easy to get discouraged. We go through hard times and you just wanna give up. And um, I think it's very important to not do that. If you're still here, you're here for a reason. There's almost a, it's a wonderful life kind of quality to the book. Is oh, that thank you. That's my favorite ever, ever movie. Love that movie. In fact, one of your reviews, I think you compared the book to It's a Wonderful Life. And I treasure that. I thought, oh, thank you. Because that's to me, that's just the highest compliment you can give anybody. Because again, that movie has such a positive message. You know, no man is poor who has friends. And how easy it is for us to, to discount the blessings in our life and to discount the importance of the people who are in our life. So it's just an important thing to remember. And you've kind of developed, Sheila, a reputation for holiday books. You've been doing this for quite a while. and uh, you've, yes. um... <laughs> About a million years. <laughs> it's kind of funny, you know, John Charles, when I first was writing, my very first one that, that really kind of hit was On Strike for Christmas. And that was, I don't even remember how many years ago that came out, but there weren't that many authors writing holiday no. books. All of a sudden, like the whole world is writing a Christmas book. So we're all kind of out there crowded on our little Christmas boat going, read me, read me. <laughs> so, I, it's hard for a reader these days because there was so much calling for your attention. And, and how do you pick, you know, we all have limited resources for how much we can spend. So how do you pick, you know, what book to read? And I must say, a lot of my friends all have Christmas books out this year that are, you know, that are wonderful. So um, it's, you know, good luck reader picking a book. Of course, I hope they'll, mine will be one of the ones they pick, but, you know, I understand it's, it's a lot to choose from, but I love writing. I love writing Christmas books. Christmas is my favorite holiday and I just like celebrating that. So it's very fun to be able to have a holiday book out every year. What would be the number one tip you would give to those um, celebrating the holiday? What would you tell them is the most important thing? Oh, wow. I would say, remember the reason for the season. Christmas is a good news holiday. Mm -hmm. You know, man has been redeemed. Even if you're in the worst possible circumstances, there's always hope. And I would say celebrate that and celebrate being with the people who care about you and who you care about. I know last year was really tough with COVID. I, I'm sure like you, like us, probably, you were probably Zooming for Christmas. And we did a lot of Christmas Zooming. I'm hoping we'll be able to gather in person this year. But again, it's like, don't take those people in your life for granted and, and don't and celebrate the holiday, really enjoy it and appreciate it and appreciate the fact you're still here. I guess that would be kind of what I would want to tell everybody. That's a great message. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, having two writers in the same household. Um, do you draw a line down the house and you both work on separate sides? Does one of you write during the day? When, talk about how you interact as writers and also as a couple. Okay, well, as Sheila said, we actually wrote a novel <clears throat> together a while back. It's a historical novel about one of the kings of Bavaria, but Mad King Ludwig, uh, the Mad King Ludwig, uh, who's famous for building that uh, Neuschwanstein, which is the castle that looks a lot like the Disney castles because it's the original. And so there were many heated discussions uh, as we wrote that book as to how we how should we how we should portray the king, um, in what directions we should go, um, we also we almost went scene by scene, uh, nip and tuck, and I wrote uh, half the book and she wrote the other half, and so there was a lot of neg negotiation that had to be done to finally agree on the final product. And um, I would give my pages to Sheila and I wouldn't recognize them when I got them back. <laughs> I actually have to ask her, you know, what does this mean and what am I doing here? And so I, I took her advice almost all the time, probably 99% of the time. What a smart man. Right. 
And so, um, so, and she did that with the book Safe Harbor too. I mean, I gave her pages and I didn't recognize it when I got it back. So there was a lot of, uh, you know, we didn't scream at each other, but there were a lot of heated discussions because, you know, we both have our own will and our own, uh, had our own maybe vision for the book. And we just had to make compromises and, and work together kind of like two oxen. Yeah, trying to pull in the same direction. I must say, I, it was rather humiliating for me. It was almost like going back to writing 101 because this is a historical. And in fact, talking about mysteries, um, the death of King Ludwig is shrouded. It's kind of like the German equivalent of the Kennedy assassinate nation. There are so many theories on what happened to this guy you know, and, and how this all worked. But historical, you know, I've been writing contemporary things for many, many years. And um, I thought I was guiding us in a great direction. And I remember the first draft of this we gave to my agent. She just sent us right back to the drawing board and said, what are you doing? Well, much more politely than that. But it was kind of like, oh, my gosh. And that was an interesting little lesson to learn, because sometimes when you've been doing this a while, you kind of get to thinking you know it all. And it was like, hmm, I do not know it all. <laughs> and uh, it was very, it was a big learning curve, learning how not only just to work together, but to be writing something that was a little more outside my comfort zone and realizing, you know, I had this really brilliant literary approach I was going to take and I, I fell right on my face. And um, maybe there's a lesson there too for writers, you know, don't, if you fall on your face, it's okay, you know, you'll do a face plant, but then you get up and you dust yourself off and you try again. And eventually each time you fall, it's a learning experience. So, um, you know, as those who are struggling to build a career, I just, you know, don't give up because you're going to have your stumbles along the way and, and you're going to have your learning experiences. But yeah, I should mention that um, <laughs> Sheila's agent, Paige Wheeler, um, now has the ninth version of the book. So <laughs> yeah. you can see uh, it took us a while to write it and it went through a lot of yes. different uh, uh, aberrations along the way. And, and there, there could be a 10th version, we don't know. I'm hoping there's not a 10th uh, I'm not ready to go to double digits. But, but uh, yeah, advice to writers, I mean, you, you might have to really uh, rewrite a book many times. So, you know, buck up and do it. And be humble and open, willing to take criticism. I mean, that's one thing I will praise my husband for. He is very good at objectively stepping back and go, hmm, I think, you, I think you're right. And I'm going to. I'm going to redo this and um, then and same for me I mean you have to be if you're working on a project together you both have to be willing to to give a little bit to give and take so um, and even if you're writing a book together my advice would be I mean not together but alone get in a group that can critique you maybe they're amateurs too but uh, I've known writers who uh, won't take advice it's like this is my book this is the way it's going to be and they never gotten it published so, you know, you have to kind of hold your little baby with, uh, you know, loose hands and take advice and, and try things that, that other people suggest. Yeah. Be willing to lop off your baby's nose if you have to and give it a new nose. <laughs> <laughs> so the book is being shopped around. So there's a chance we might see that in the future. The Ludwig one, yes, we will sure let you know if they, we get any takers on that. I, I do think that is one. If we don't get any, we probably will self-publish that because it's such a fascinating story. He's a uh -huh. he's a fascinating character. And like I said, boy, talk about shrouded in a mystery. Nobody knows exactly what happened, but he died under very mysterious circumstances. Well, he was, for his time, the 1840s, 50s, a giant, six foot six. And uh -huh. they found him um, in a lake near one of his castles, drowned in three feet of water. Uh -huh. well, that's hard to do when you're six foot six. And uh, the government said he drowned, although I've looked at the autopsy. There was no water in his lungs. And his doctor was with him, and so his, he died too. His daughter was, uh, his uh, doctor was killed also, strangled. And so, you know, there was a lot of cover up to a government cover up that never happens. So um, it's, it's, it, uh, his life is a fascinating story. It just is. And just remember um, reading about the cast, his castle had like the, have the grottos and all those fascinating. Oh, those are wonderful. Like We've been to several of them. And my favorite is Linderhof with the grotto. And it's got a kind of this little secret door. You go in and the, the, I don't know, subterranean or whatever the building is where the grotto is. And when you're leaving, there's a secret door in the fake rocks that you have to go out and 
it's just it's just really fun. It's very cool. He was a patron of, of <clears throat> Wagner. In fact, probably without King Ludwig II, Wagner would not have been well have. Well, he wouldn't be who he is now in I, history. I don't think he would sure. be because he was deeply in debt. He was running from his debtors, and that young King Ludwig, when he was uh, took office or you know mounted the throne when he was 18. And one of the first thing he did was track down Wagner. And so his castles, Ludwig's castles are really kind of mortar and rock and stone uh, that are living, uh, what would you call them? Well, they're a tribute to Wagner. They're, they're living tributes to the music um, of Wagner. And the grottos, you mentioned Charles, uh, are um, basically, he, he uh, that was for Lohengrin, right? I mean, that was for Lohengrin, um, and and he would have his his operas performed up in uh, up in those grottos where he would float around in the book, uh, in, in a little uh, pond, pretending he boat, was a little swan boat. Yeah, he was just pretending he was living uh, back in the ancient times of Germanic myth. So he was probably born about three hundred years too late, <laughs> sadly, to be in the myths. Right. And born a little ahead of his time. Well, anyway, but of course we could go on and on about that. And I guess we should, <laughs> we're digressing. We'll have to talk to you again if the book ever comes out. Definitely. It sounds like um, something I would love to read. Um, Sheila, I do want to take another turn with you because in addition to your holiday themed uh, books, you've written a couple popular series, one in Icicle Falls and one in, um, I'm going to get the name wrong, Moon Moonlight at Harbor, uh huh. At Harbor, yeah. Tell us a little about those two series. Icicle Falls is actually Leavenworth, Washington, in disguise. Leavenworth is a charming little Bavarian town in the Cascades, and they have a very interesting history. In the early '60s, this was a timber town and a railroad town. The railroad got diverted, timber dried up, and the town was turning into a ghost town. And the very few left said, "What are we going to do?" And someone had been stationed in. Germany in the war and said, you know, this looks a lot like Bavaria. We could turn this into a Bavarian town and make it a tourist attraction. And so they did. It kind of had old Western fronts and was just kind of this ratty little town. And they redesigned the town. Everyone pitched in. They worked and redid this place. And uh, of course, now they get thousands and thousands and thousands of visitors, especially during the holidays. Oh my goodness. And it's just, it's adorable. It's got a beautiful beautiful setting there in the mountains and I just thought it'd be so much fun we've got we had gone there several times for book signings and had gotten to know people there and just loved it and I thought it would be wonderful to set a book in a town like that because it's just such an inspiration so that was that was that series and um, now I'm in the midst of a series the Moonlight Harbor and that's actually based on Ocean Shores Washington which is a fun little town on the Washington coast Actually, they call themselves a city. I'm really, I guess we're a city, but <laughs> we're a very small city. But anyway, it's very fun. It's very charming. They have all kinds of crazy little tourist attractions. You've got the beach and the people here are wonderful. And I thought, again, this would be a lovely place to do tribute to and set a book series in. So both of these book series happen to be with towns that are based on real towns. So it's kind of fun. I change a few things and obviously the names have been changed to protect the innocent, but um, <laughs> uh, those are the inspirations for the series. Um, I always love to hear what authors are reading and as we approach the holiday book buying season, can you tell us a little bit about what was on your summer reading list this year and what others might wanna get for themselves or other readers? Oh yes. Well, as I mentioned, um, all my friends, um, Brenda Novak, Rayanne Thane, Susan Mallory, Debbie Maincomber, um, Nancy Nagel, they all have holiday books coming out. That's just the tip of the iceberg. There are a lot of them, but those I would certainly recommend to anybody who's looking for a holiday read. This summer I read the, the, um, the Bookstore on the Beach by Ren Brenda Novak. That was a big book of hers. And Rayanne's The Path to Sunshine Cove. And Nancy Nagel's The Shell Collector, which was a sweet book. And then come fall, I switch it to uh, self-education mode, to back to school mode and start reading nonfiction. And I've been, I do my little show and tell here. I'll hold this up and hope maybe it will show in the camera. I have been reading. This is called The Great Influenza. It's by John Barry. It's not about what's going on now. This was written and came out before the pandemic. And uh, as I was mentioning to you earlier, whatever side of the, the vaccine you come down on, because I know we're a little divided on that issue right now, um, 
I think this should be ref should be required reading for everybody, no matter what you think about that, because you're getting a great overview of the history of science, how vaccines are created. You're hearing about the different doctors and scientists who brought us so many things that we take for granted today. You're also hearing about how the influenza spread and you can kind of see some echoes of what had happened with us as you're reading this going, oh my gosh, this and this and this sounds so familiar. And of course, then it also talks about the history of the time and what was going on in the country and, and it kind of gives some ideas for how this got to be such a big mess. So I just think it's fascinating reading and uh, it's, it's good. We all have our favorite genres, obviously at the Poison Pen, the favorite genre is mystery. And uh, I like a good mystery, especially on TV, which is, doesn't make any sense at all, but I love to watch, I love to watch mysteries and police procedurals. Um, but sometimes it's kind of good to do a little bit of nonfiction and educate yourself on something. And that was a really excellent book. I read another one other, and then I'll be quiet and let Robert talk, but uh, it was called Layered Money. And this was fascinating too. And I don't remember, I don't happen to have that with me where we are right now. I, so I can't remember the exact name of the author of that, but very interesting reading because it talks about the history of money, how we came from bartering to money being something, how governments got involved and the future. And of course, he's talking about all the, the cryptocurrency, which of course is kind of jumping at us from the, the horizon here. And so I think that's really fascinating reading too. So it's, you know, it's always fun to, I would encourage people, maybe give yourself an assignment to do a little bit of course on whatever subject you feel like maybe you don't know enough on and give a try in a book like that. I guess I'm next. Mm -hmm. So uh, I read a mix of historical and <clears throat> current books. Uh, this year, I read Le Mis. In German. In German. It was supposed to be in German. Victor Hugo didn't get the memo. <laughs> uh, so I, I read that. It was kind of an abridged version because the original version, I think, is 17, 1800 pages long. And that's a little over my limit. But mm -hmm. I, I love, you know, that the book the Le Mis is such a story of yeah. of forgiveness and um, a story of somebody who's able to you know ab actually able to forgive mm -hmm. uh, at, at the end we know the ending where he forgives the the police uh, constable who's made his life a, a, a misery so i read that one i also read a tolstoy's book uh, called uh, the resurrection mm -hmm. a great book about a young man who gets a young girl pregnant he, um, this is before, uh, before the Russian Revolution. He, he's, he's in the nobility and he gets her pregnant and he abandons her. Eventually, uh, she gets thrown out of the house because it becomes apparent that she, uh, out of uh, her, aunt, uh, her aunt's house, who, who didn't uh, think, uh, you know, in those days, you should have a, a, an unmarried pregnant woman in the house. She gets into prostitution. She gets falsely accused of, of killing somebody. And he eventually hears about that and he actually follows her after he, she gets convicted to um, Siberia to, to be with her, to, to support her. And I think the baby died, but uh, I can't really remember. I think the baby died, but, and, and so again, this, this story of redemption and um, eventually she forgives him because basically he has pretty much ruined her life. So, uh, and one more historical thing before I get to a modern one. I'm reading now a fascinating book I would recommend to anybody, and that's the autobiography of Mark Twain. <laughs> we read through it, and you can see Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer and, 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 all, the, um, and all the background to um, Twain writing his novels. So um, it's the two volumes and a probably total of 700 pages, but you just can't put it down. And one more book. I'm reading The Lilac Girls, which Sheila recommended to me yeah. about ladies who uh, ended up in, in Robin's book, a, a concentration camp for uh, ladies. And unfortunately, uh, they are called the rabbits. They are experimented on. And again, you have this you know, female bonding where they have to stick together. I mean, what else can they do? And uh, they have to survive being experimented on. And eventually, I haven't got to the end yet, but, but Sheila said there is some redemption there too, because 
some of the physicians who, for whatever reason, thought it was a good idea to experiment on people, uh, were tracked down for war crimes. Yeah, so that's it. That sounds great. Um, I do also want to ask you, the rumor has it, since the Poison Pen is a mystery bookstore started out that way, that you have a special connection with Donald Westlake? Oh, he's my favorite. I would I'd love to have had a chance to have met him. He is no longer with us. I think he was a grand master in the Mystery Writers of America. And I mean, that I would just, of course, some of the books are a little dated, but the humor is still hilarious. They're so clever, so brilliant. And yeah, so if somebody is wandering through the poison pen and looking for something new to read or a new author to try out, I would sure recommend him. He is like my, one of my all-time favorite authors. I just love that guy. They've been reprinting a couple of his older books. So yeah, you can now get your hands on some of them. That's great. Yes, very fun. Well, I can't believe we're out of time. It's flown by so quickly. Um, I do before we end, I want to thank Sheila and Gerhardt. Sheila's new book is A Little Christmas Spirit. Gerhardt's is Safe Harbor. Um, you've both been fabulously entertaining. Um, any last words for our listeners? Just thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you being readers. We really do. Without readers, who would writers have to tell a story to? So, And booksellers. Oh, my goodness. What would we do without the support of our booksellers? And John Charles, you are just legend in the writing community for how supportive you are of writers and we appreciate that so much so thank you for having us on today it's been just so much fun to visit with you it's been delightful and thank you for writing such entertaining books and thank everyone for tuning in to another virtual author chat at the poison pen okay and in case i lose you because usually that's what happens when they put me near a computer and I close <laughs> things out. Thank you again. You're both just delightful, wonderfully entertaining. Um, I appreciate your patience as we got past the first deadline and got into the second one. <laughs> no worries. Thank you, John. We really do appreciate you being yes. willing to reach out. And, and thanks for giving my sweetie a chance to talk a little bit too. Like I'd mentioned, he's he realized that he needed to do some reformatting on this book. My goal for him is down the road to be able to enjoy being traditionally published. I hope that's going to happen for him. And but again, thank you. You just, oh. you really are a delight and we just love oh. you hugely. That's very sweet of you. I can't wait to read the book, the Ludwig book. That just sounds yeah. fantastic. It's crossed. You'll be one of the first ones. Don't worry. <laughs> For sure. Thanks, John Charles. You thank have a you. great rest of the weekend. You too. And have a wonderful holiday. If I don't you too. Sure. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.